Hey guys, it's good to see you. Uh, today's, uh, I guess, possibly the last Sunday we will do it this way, and then, um, and then next Sunday uh, we will actually be meeting together, but the service will still be taped, uh, the message and some songs, a couple songs. So you can, if you're not coming to church yet next Sunday on the 7th, um, you can still go online and see the message and a couple songs, okay? So I just want you to be aware of that. And we'll, we'll probably also include the, uh, any announcements so you're, you're staying on top of everything. Um, so for today's uh, service, if you will, online, um, after this welcome, uh, Tammy and I are kind of re-welcoming you. Um, and then... After that, there'll be a, a song from our, our worship team, and then there'll be a little video uh, from our region about Pentecost, and it's kind of a slideshow of new churches that have, have begun, so it's about the um, uh, special offering for Pentecost. And then after that, um, uh, will be another song, and then my message, and then I think actually after my message will be another song. And, and, um, and then I'll, 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 I'll say goodbye. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, actually, in my hand here is Aunt Clara. Aunt Clara is one of the two um, uh, white tree frogs that we have in our, our, our office here. Yeah, we have frogs and dogs. Yeah. Anyway, this is Aunt Clara. She is adorable. I'll bring her up to you. She is just, um, she's a chunk is what she is. She, she. She is just so cute. She loves to eat mealworms and crickets, and we'll just stay right on, um, stay right with you. I mean, you could dress her up, and she would be perfectly happy. But there she is. Isn't she cute? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how it's, whether it's overwhelming seeing her this way or not. I, I, I don't know. But she is so cute. Mm. I'm going to put her right back in the terrarium, okay? And I'll, I'll be right back, all right? Um... um so, all right. Love you. You guys take care. Hopefully we'll see you on the 7th. All right. Uh, Aunt Clara and I, um, here Aunt Clara, let's say, let's say goodbye. Say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Tammy. Hey, Steve. How are you? Good. How are you? I am great. I am so here. excited. Hey, First Christian Church. Oh, there, there, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome! Hey, hey, yes. how are you doing? I can't wait. You. We're going to be getting together here on the 7th, and it's just, we are just so excited to have you guys. Oh, I miss you Steve, all. What? Steve, what? 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 What's, what's what? this? What? <laughs> what? Well, what? What's on your face? What have you been it's doing? It's my mouth. It's my mouth. <laughs> it's, it's, your my, well, it's, it's my mask. Well, it's your mouth. That's great. But yeah, that's yeah, it's my mask. mask. I just Steve. figured. No, I just figured. You know, people can, you know, get a facial while while they're worshiping, and I just thought, isn't that great? No, so, Steve. Steve. What? What? You have to have a mask that covers your mouth and your nose. Oh. Seriously, you mean like my? Like, yeah, I have to like put this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. is it really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll do this. So How's everybody. That? That's great. Is that great? Yep. Is that okay? Everybody will need <laughs> to wear a mask. I'm still getting a facial. You are. So everyone, this is super, this is super sea slug slime. So yay. Super yeah. Sea super sea slug slime. I see and that just, five yeah. fast. I just, it's, oh, it feels so good. Oh, anyway. Steve. So, up over your nose. Over your nose. Yeah. So when we come to church, everyone wears it. Everyone wears a mask up over your nose and there. Now, remember though that the praise team... And the pastor, when they speak, will not be wearing their masks. We just want you to know, but everyone else will be wearing their masks. So we can be heard well. Yes. And so, yeah, okay. okay. So. So, so on Sun, so what, what you're going to hear today, you know, there's obviously our wonderful welcome. Our wonderful, wonderful welcome. Right hello, then, hello. And then, and then the, 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 the worship team is going to share a couple songs. Woo, and the words and, will be on the bottom. Yes, the words okay. will be on. And then, and then we're going to have a little video for Pentecost because today is actually Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. Isn't that awesome? Yay! Yeah, we got to celebrate. Maybe we'll have cake and eat in the parking lot. You there suggested that. Yeah, right? we should have cake and so eat in the parking lot. Cake in the parking lot. lot. We'll have to do that and celebrate the birth of the church. And then we'll have, um, what else do we do? Oh, we'll have 
Oh, the message? Yeah, I got it. I'll the say, message. Yeah, I'll and say communion. something. Communion. And, 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 and communion. So, and offering. Offering. we got to throw offering in there. Oh, okay. We have a lot to be thankful yeah, for. Yeah, we will. In we will. this church. So, yeah. yeah. So, First Christian Church, we love you. Mm. Bring your masks. We'll provide one for you if you don't have one. And we have the hand sanitizer. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, yes. There we let's go. do this. Can't wait. All right. Love you guys. Good seeing you. God bless bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Mm. God bless. To rejoice, exult, revel. To celebrate the many memorable moments of life, large and small. Perhaps with voices raised in song. Or hearts exploding with excitement. Or family and friends drawn to a holiday table to raise a toast. But how do we celebrate a truly world-changing, life-altering milestone. Such as the welcoming of more than a thousand new churches into the family of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Since 2001, this has been the goal of the 2020 vision. And we reached and exceeded our goal ahead of schedule through the new church movement. 
thanks to nurturing disciples like you and your generous support of the Pentecost offering. Each year, half of this special offering stays in your local region or area to plant and nourish new churches. The other half is used throughout the United States and Canada by New Church Ministry to train, equip, and assist church leaders at events like Leadership Academy. Imagine more than a thousand new and affiliating faith communities in just 20 years living into the teachings of Jesus Christ by welcoming the homeless, feeding the hungry, teaching the young, and transforming their communities through hands-on mission and ministry. And know that this is just the beginning. More than a thousand new churches and counting. Celebrate them and our faith with your continued support of the Pentecost offering and the new church movement. So that more disciples will be drawn to our family table. Where all are welcome. And their places are waiting.
the message I'm going to share with you today is not an easy one uh, for me to, to give um, or to hear. Uh, right now there's so much chaos going on in our nation with the pandemic and with the peaceful protests that have become riots and so much anger, so much fear, and you know, the National Guard and law enforcement are, are placed in a situation that's like a no-win situation. They're trying to keep peace, and the vast majority of people want peace. They just want their voice to be heard, and we get um, a rogue group of people who are taking advantage of the pain and turning protests in, into riots and violence, and it's just, making everything worse. But there is some thing underpinnings to all of this that needs to be addressed. And that's what I want to address today in the message. And I'll explain myself, okay? And I need to keep God's word in front of me. I do, and I need to look at it often to keep me focused. In the wake of what we have rightly called lynchings, of Ahmad Arbery uh, in New Brunswick, Georgia on February 23rd and um, of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota this past week. We find ourselves with everything that's going on and with those two grievous deaths at a point in the church's season that we're celebrating Pentecost today, the birth of the church. If we ever need a new birth, it's now. Okay? The Holy Spirit came upon the followers of Jesus, of Jesus in Jerusalem, creating a community that spanned cultures and ethnicities, creating a community where people looked upon each other, even with their different languages and skin color, and saw family. Thinking about that image, I also have to turn to the Apostle Paul's reference to the Holy Spirit when he said in Romans 8, chapters, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 27, when he said, sometimes, and this is what I'm looking for, sometimes the Holy Spirit needs to intercede with groanings too deep for words. with a very disoriented and weary soul I'm preaching to you today. I'm compelled in the light of the latest examples of racism to confront, and I've never said this before in all my 30 years of ministry, to confront my white brothers and sisters in this message today. To challenge you, not with opinions, but with truth. Grounded in Christ. but I do so with groans that are deeper than the words I'm trying to convey. I don't believe Jesus would remain silent about any of this that's going on right now. Okay. He didn't in his day and age. He addressed injustice in his day and age. All of his parables and teachings addressed the issues of his day. Okay. Jesus didn't go around offering a, a gospel, fluffy, light message you know, and talking about Noah and the animals going into the ark two by two. No. Jesus took the truths of such Old Testament stories and the words of the prophets and applied them to his day using imagery and storytelling and parables to address the matters, to reach out to the people where they were to deal with the injustice of his day and age. And more often than not, he was calling out the bigoted religious establishment and the social norms that oppressed the most vulnerable. I'm livid with how black people are treated in this country. It's disconcerting to know that so many people sully Jesus' name 
by trying to align their misdeeds or the misdeeds of others with the gospel. Oh, some of them are good people. Don't want to go there right now, okay? God never cosigns hatred. Never has and never will. Billy Holiday's um, famous 1939 intonation, Southern trees bear a strange fruit, resonates today. Those of us who have ears to hear, listen. Ahmad Aubrey was gunned down in broad daylight by a father and son who, according to news reports, um, have insisted that they were trying to make a citizen's arrest. Yes, the father and son happened to be white. Mm -hmm. This brand of racial violence in America is as old as the day is long. Just is. Hearing George Floyd telling the officer on the streets of Minneapolis that he couldn't breathe while the officer's knee was on his neck, and to hear George Floyd call out for his mother as he took his last breath, took my breath away, and it still does. It reminded me of a childhood memory I had went straight back there. It was the first time I ever went to, to a camp. And it was in 1971. It was a, a school patrol camp. You went there, uh, you know, to train to be uh, an officer in the, in the school patrol. And um, I got on the bus. I was really nervous. And I took a seat by a peer of mine, a young boy by the name of George. And George was the only um, black child on that bus. In fact, I think, if memory serves me right, he may have been the only black child there at that entire camp. Hmm. few things about George you should know. He loved the Boston Red Sox. He could run as fast as the wind, and he could throw a stone a mile. And he became my buddy during that week. We bunked together. When I came home from camp, a mom was asking me about my experiences, you know, her little boy being off the camp for the first time, and, and I was telling her, and um, she asked me about George. She said to me, as I saw you get on the bus to leave for camp, I saw you sit, ne sit, sit next to that black boy. I was so proud of you. I didn't quite know what my, what my mom was saying. Um, so I asked her, you know, about why she was proud, proud of me. And then she said, honey, he was the only black boy on that bus. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, my mom's can see color difference. Okay. She said, honey, George will likely grow up and always be a black boy in a white man's world. And I said, you know, being a child, I was said, no, he'll be a man when he grows up, Mom. No, no, honey, listen to me. That's true, he will be a man, but sadly many people will always see him as a black boy trying to live in a white man's world. When people see him coming, they will often think the worst, okay? Or at the very least, that some trouble is heading their way. He will not have the opportunities you will have in life. And I told my mom, but, but, but George, he's a great guy. I mean, uh, he could run so fast, he kicked the ball. I mean, I was just... And she said, honey, there will be times 
that all George will have in his life is his mama, even when he's a grown man. Because many people are only going to see the color of his skin. I'll never forget that talk with my mom. I wonder if George Floyd had a similar talk with his mom, hearing from his mom how he would always be a black boy in a white man's world. I thought of that. Well, my mom, that my mom shared that with me when I saw that video of George Floyd crying out for his mom with his last breath. Proving what my mom told me back in 1971 is so true today. Today I'm trying to find my footing in this world, in this society, as a white man. I am. I'm trying to find solace in God in all this. Not because I'm a pastor, all right? But because our Lord's story does change in the end with redemption and a new perspective on social constructions and power in Jesus' day. For centuries, Jesus' followers have been working towards change and redemption in the societies that they have found themselves, in the cultures and where they have lived. We are required to do the same here in Nampa, Idaho, and wherever you are as you're listening to this message. We need to have our voice crying out, our egos put aside, we need to denounce unjust actions and unjust policies need to be changed. And it requires the majority of us to see these injustices, okay? And to rise up on behalf of the abused and the oppressed. Sadly, to add fuel to society's pain society's anger right now. We've had these uh, initially peaceful protests become riots. Fueled, many are saying, by outside influences who are taking advantage of this opportunity basically to burn down black communities. And so the black community just suffers even more in all of this. And adding to the pain we get a leader in our nation tweeting things like, when the looting begins, the shooting begins. To advocate such violence in times like this, like these right now that we find ourselves in, are words of a very, very small and fearful man. It's going to take another Pentecost to happen to each of us and all of us to yield to the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit and to use our tongues to call out for justice and our hands to fight for it in a peaceful way to build a community of justice and righteousness. Often, the scripture readings for today, for today being Pentecost Sunday, often end before they get into Peter's sermon in the book of Acts. In his sermon, on that day of Pentecost, he calls out the people who are there, all those who just experienced the Spirit. He calls, he calls out the people and the systems in which they've been living, saying that you guys out there are responsible for crucifying Jesus either by your actions or your silence. And how did those listeners that day respond? When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the apostles, 
brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent. That's in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38, in that area. America, we have been crucifying our own for too long. I hope your heart has been cut by the tragedies of Ahmad and Brianna and Christian and George. Those are just for the more recent names okay, that have circulated recently in media, individuals who have died through acts of racism, by acts of racism. I hope we're ready to repent and move with the Spirit of God. White, white Christians, perhaps because in part due to the obsessive, fast-paced culture of the privileged, have favored convenient and woeful forgetfulness. Many of us have chosen to stick our heads in the sand altogether, opting to remain ill-informed about the past and present in hopes of achieving maybe an artificial peace. Oh, this will all blow over eventually. You know, in a week from now, we'll be on to something. Mm -mm. That's got to cease and desist. There's a better way. Dear white brothers and sisters, it's time, it's past time to learn about things like the Red Summer of 1919. Do you know about that? Or Black Wall Street and the 1921 Tulsa race riot and what happened in 1923 in the town of Rosewood, Florida. Do you know any of these stories? It's past time to take sobering stock of 14 year old, 14 year old Emmett Till's killing back in 1955 or of James Byrd's killing four decades later. These atrocities were not moral anomalies. They are a reflection of our culture and society through the years and the decades and the centuries. Maybe some of you just need to digest the raw visual revulsion of an uncivilized, unrepentant society by turning to a book by James Allen. It's entitled, Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America. That would at least be a step towards remembering the desolation that sin, that racism causes. Ignorance is far from being blissful. It's nothing like the God we worship. Contrary to what a warped do-gooder uh, mentality asserts by saying, oh, racism, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's an abstract superiority complex that exists in some yonder distant domain. No, 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 it isn't. Okay? Racism has legs and it travels well. And it has traveled, traveled well. City to city, village to village, home to home. It's as personal as it is political. It's been birthed and institutionalized within people and has been dispersed through webs of, this, of deceit and exploitation. Tragically, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd's death are merely the latest testimony to racial hatred. So many white people struggle to comprehend, let alone address, racism's rank vicissitudes. Because that's what racism and its corresponding socioeconomic privileges do. We just don't want to address it because we're doing well. We benefit while others suffer based on a power structure 
designed to enslave others and provide an ironclad dominance and autom autonomy to people like myself. These dynamics are so entrenched in our psyche and lifestyle that empathy often becomes fleeting, if not impossible. Say what you will, but in a highly color-coded society, racism is infinitely more destructive than any virus. Now, I know it's hard for some of you to hear these words, if you're still even listening to me. You know, we, 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 we white Christians feel we are, are well-intentioned and, and we are enlightened. But the truth, the truth hurts. And here's the truth. If you are white, you have no clue to the PTSD-like realities that black, that black people deal with in our country on a daily basis. If you're black, you have legitimate fears as you go out into the day, wondering if you'll face a police officer who's had a bad day or who just has bad values. And it may just cost you severely. If you're black, you have constant calculations when you go into a store to shop, wondering whether you are being profiled or not. And that is legitimate concern. You are held to an inequitable standard in a workplace unlike your white colleagues and friends, you're likely to be mistreated in countless ways, whether overt or subtly, because of your race. And you'll experience incidences that will leave no doubt that you have been victimized by racial injustice. That is a daily experience. All of this and so much more, you know, we white folk don't have to worry about. You know, all of this and so much more is beyond demeaning and draining. It's just debilitating. But I don't know about you, but I go out to a store and I don't think about I'm I'm getting profiled or people watching where I am or what I'm doing. We get the benefit of the doubt. We don't have to deal with clashing with some homegrown bigotry out there or some good old boys club. Or some father and son just going out to do good for the white community. Bringing their guns. Because there's a black man running in our neighborhood. And he's been around a construction site where he got some water. That was it. We don't have to worry. I don't worry about the neighborhoods I'll run in. We get the benefit of the doubt that we have not earned while our black brothers and sisters, no matter what they've earned, they are likely to be viewed with suspicion and malice simply because they are not white. In moments like this, it, be, it becomes grotesquely obvious that many of my white sisters and brothers do not understand whiteness. In his essay, uh, Pastor Andrew T. Draper, essay entitled, Can White People Be Saved? Explains that white people are not the issue. Rather, the issue is whiteness. 
And what's whiteness? Okay. Bear with me here. Don't want to lose you. Whiteness, according to W.E.B. Du Bois, is an idolatrous system of embedded norms in intricate, intricately arranged to prefer, esteem, and profit white people by any means necessary. Now, the white, whiteness is a system put into society, interwoven through all the mores and the norms and the social innuendos, subtly and overt, to keep white people in positions of power and opportunity. And we act so innocent. How could this happen? I'm not a racist. Oh, the number of times I hear that. It's too late, okay? It's too late to proclaim your innocence, okay? If you've not spoken up or been proactive in race relations, you know, you're not innocent, all right? We are more like that young lady in Central Park in New York who this past week called police and I said that she was um, being accosted and she felt fearful of this African-American man there in the park. She felt really threatened. I'm thinking, really? This man was bird watching in that part of the park. He'd asked her to put her dog on a leash. In that part of the park, you're supposed to have your dog on a leash. He asked her to put the dog on a leash. This woman she says she's not a racist. In fact, she says, you know, she's a liberal who supported Hillary Clinton. Whatever. But what's her knee-jerk reaction when she comes upon this man in the park? She sees skin color and she calls the police. It's too late for many of us with white skin to say that we're innocent and plead ignorance when we've lived in a nation whose economy was built upon the backs of slaves. You know what happened in Georgia and in Minnesota? Were lynchings, plain and simple. They were. And that is what black Americans have had to be dealing with for centuries. Wake up. Jesus wouldn't be silent about what's been going on. In Christ, we're to operate down here according to marching orders from God. I guess you could put it that way. And God is no respecter of color, coinage, or class. All right? And if that's true, then what I believe our black Christian brothers and sisters want from us is renunciation. Renouncing the way we have been living and the things we have supported, and pledging consistent advocacy and an action for racial justice. I don't believe our black brothers and sisters want so much our pity or our tears or lip service or guilt as much as they want us to renunciate what we have been embracing. with our lifestyle. Yes, I get it. You're single-handedly, you cannot extinguish racism and all of her ugly minions. But I encourage you to take a cue from James chapter 1 verses 19 through 21, where we hear those words to uphold a listening posture while shunning wickedness in this world, to listen to others and to take it in whenever you encounter that wickedness that has fallen upon others. That we need to make a conscious decision to acknowledge and faithfully steward the opportunities we have and where it's appropriate to dismantle our white 
privilege. Christian complicity with racism doesn't require overt acts of bigotry. All it does, all it requires is for you to remain silent, to be mute, and you feed into racism. Okay? To be mute in the face of injustice or offer uncritical support for the status quo. Dear friends, we need to be willing to say and do hard things, both big and small. I'm trying. I'm trying. It ain't easy. My Bible, my Bible tells me, okay, that I hold intrinsic and essential value, as do you. For we have all been created in God's image, right? Genesis 1, uh, verse 27, Psalm 139, 14, Ephesians 2, 10, all right? Um, just to name a few. And we are bought at the price, the price of our Lord upon a cross. We have been bought at that price. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. We are all equals. sad I even have to say this. Black people are not lesser, okay? They are not disposable things meant to serve you. They're not to exist to put you at ease or to massage your unaddressed naivete, your hurts, your biases. Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd should be alive today. The ugly truth, they are not because of this country's original sin of racism. A shameful stain that needs to be addressed with deliberate speed. Josh Kelly's um, song, uh, Busy Making Memories, maybe you know of it, it's kind of a country feel to it. Busy Making Memories is the name of the song. Google it, look it up. You know, it provides the imagery and the, the words of the song, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's prone to activate the tear ducts, all right? Busy making memories. And she was all these beautiful images of family life. Black people in America are not able to make such sweet memories as freely as we are. As, as their white counterparts on account of racist actions that keep them from living a full, rich life. I think we always need to keep it in the back of our head, Galatians 6, 7, you know, um, do not be deceived, God will not be mocked, you know, for whatever one sows, that you will reap. We need a Pentecost moment. We need to experience the Holy Spirit being poured out upon us. We do, right? Am I alone in this? We need to hear Peter's Pentecost sermon. Read it in the book of Acts. You know, basically saying to the people, get out while you can. <laughs> All right? Get out of this sick and stupid culture. You no longer have to be imprisoned by corrupt politics and corrupt religion and a corrupt social and economic system. Get out of the rat race. Follow Jesus Christ. Take responsibility that you crucified him. All right? And follow him. And receive that Holy Spirit that's in you. That day, some around like 3,000 people took Peter at his word and were born again together and chose to live life another way, following the way, the truth, and the life. They changed their old habits and practices of faith that no longer work. I've seen it right here in front of me. They, they, 
they open their hearts to one another. You know, that, that first church on the day of Pentecost, oh my, it was near perfect. I mean, they, they got together daily and they had potlucks and everyone brought a dish for potluck. Everyone. There was plenty of food. That's a darn near perfect church, right? Mm. No, and no one whined about long sermons or about sermons being too political. Well, about sermons not giving them the gospel light, fluffy stuff that won't, you know, make them feel uncomfortable. Mm, 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 mm. And people didn't worry about receipts lagging behind budget. People from many tongues and nations looked upon each other that day and saw family. We got to hold on to that image, folks. The book of Christ, the, the, the book of Christ, the body of Christ described in Acts was lean, agile, and well-toned in all the right places. Everyone shared. Everyone let go of that me mentality and embraced that we mentality and spirit. Now's the time for us to practice what we've been preaching all along here. Okay? We must be born again. We must become a new body, a church created in God's image, sharing Christ's love, and carrying the fire of the Holy Spirit within us. And where the hue of one's skin is not even in the equation, other than showing how beautiful and colorful humanity can be. We're we're not a building, right? We are a body, the body of Christ. May we be a body of innovative growth, a body vulnerable, a body willing to be prophetic, okay? Willing to say and do the hard things, both big and small. And may we be a church entering into an unknown future full of possibilities, advocating and working towards a day where all of God's children, all of God's children, have the equal opportunity to become the person that God longs for them to be. God help us to be that kind of church, that kind of community. But it begins with you. It begins with me. Let us pray. Almighty God, fill us with your peace and your presence. Give us the courage. Uh, fill us with that spirit on this day that we celebrate the coming of your spirit. May we be the kind of community that just provides this image, this rainbow hue of all the colors of your children just coming together as one. We're, we can offer an example. We can be a light of racial justice. A community where we are willing to lay down our life for one another and look upon each other as brother and sister. Help us to model the kind of community your son gave his life to. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Love you guys. I do. I wouldn't have shared these words if I didn't. God bless you. Peace be with you.